Hello everybody and welcome to another A-Level Chemistry exam question walkthrough. This time we're going to be focusing on redox titrations. This is a really tricky topic and I'm going to pick a couple of questions focusing on the calculations aspect of these titrations. As ever, I'm going to write down my thoughts in blue and the answers that are going to get you the marks in green. And this time I'm going to upload a PDF of the questions themselves in the chat. Thanks for that suggestion. And that means that you can have a go at the questions yourself and then watch this video back and have a look at where the marks are coming from. In the walkthrough, I'm going to focus on writing down M1, M2, etc. And I'm going to make sure it's really obvious where you get your transferred error. Because typically for redox titrations, if you make a mistake at the early stage, you don't lose any further marks provided you carry out the correct process with your incorrect value. And so that will be obvious where I've written M1, M2, etc. So let's take a look at this first question now. There is some contextual information at the top of the page about iron from the blast furnace containing carbon and then some more extra kind of background. And then we dive in on the actual question itself. And it says at one stage, a 1.27 gram sample of impure iron reacted with an excess of dilute sulfuric acid. All of the iron was then converted to iron sulfate then that solution was transferred to a different flask and made up to a volume of 250 centimeters cubed then a 25 cm cubed sample of the solution was reacted exactly with 19.6 cm cubed of 0.022 moles per decimeter cubed potassium manganate 7. Now as I was reading that out I was drawing a diagram along the bottom that told the story of what was actually taking place in this chemical reaction and it's not necessary for parts A and in fact parts B, but when we hit part C, the five mark question, this will prove invaluable in terms of unpicking the pathway through this five mark question. So let's take a look at the early questions first. It says write an equation for the reaction between iron and dilute sulfuric acid. And whenever you react a metal with an acid, you always make a salt and hydrogen. And we know from the question that we're going to make iron 2 sulfate. And we know that sulfate is SO4 2 minus. So iron 2 sulfate will just simply be FeSO4. And we also make hydrogen, which is a diatomic gas. And so that will just be H2. And we were using iron metal. So that is just Fe and it was reacting with sulfuric acid, H2SO4. And so that is the chemical equation for the first reaction. The difficulty gets stepped up quite a lot by part B, and it says write an equation for the reaction of iron 2 ions with manganate 7 ions in acid solution. Now that's a real clue that if it's in acid solution, then there's going to be the presence of H+. Now what's weird here is they've given us three lines and equations typically only take one line and that's because we need to work out the half equations first before we can work out what the overall equation is. So the iron ions are Fe2 plus and you need to remember that when they undergo redox reactions Fe2 plus turns into Fe3 plus. Then in terms of balancing this half equation, there is no imbalance in atoms, there's no imbalance in hydrogen and oxygen. So we just dive in on stage four, which is to add an electron to the right hand side to make both sides be two plus. Then we have to tackle the manganate seven, MnO4 minus. And we should remember that manganese, when it undergoes a redox titration, becomes Mn2+. Now, tackling the redox, we still don't need to balance in terms of non-oxygen and hydrogen because there's one manganese on both sides. Step two is to balance the oxygen. There are four oxygen on the left-hand side. There are none on the right-hand side, so we need to add 4H2O to the right-hand side. Then when we move on to the hydrogen, there are now eight hydrogen on the right hand side, no hydrogen on the left hand side. So we need to add eight H plus to the left hand side. Then we finally tackle charge. The right hand side currently has no charge from the water, two plus from the manganese, which gives it a two plus charge overall, eight plus from the hydrogen, and then a minus from the manganese means this is seven plus currently, 
and so we need to add five electrons to make both sides be equal to two plus. And so now it's just a case of combining these half equations and cancelling out the electrons. And so the top half equation shows only one electron being lost, but the bottom equation shows five electrons being gained. So we need to multiply that top equation through by five and then add it all together. And when we do that, we get MnO4 minus plus 8H plus plus 5Fe2 plus turns into Mn2 plus plus 4H2O plus 5Fe3 plus. And that's all necessary in green for that one mark. And now we move on to part C, the trickiest part of this question, because it's the maths part of the redox titration. So they have asked us to calculate the percentage purity by mass of carbon in the 1.27 gram sample. And so that brings us back to the pictures we've drawn at the bottom. In this 1.27 grams of impure iron, there is also carbon, and we don't know how much. But what we have to do is we have to work backwards from the reaction with manganate 7 because we know the conch and the vol of the manganate 7 and we now know the ratio it reacts with the iron in and then we can scale backwards because we took a 25 cm cubed portion out and from there we can know how many moles were in this 250 solution and therefore how many moles of iron there were in the original sample. And that's what we have to do. And that's why I think the diagrams are really helpful because they help you unpick what's actually gone on during this reaction. So the first thing that we have to do is work out the moles of MnO4- in that 19.6 cm cubed that was added. So it's concentration times by volume. The volume, of course, has got to be in dm cubed, so 0 0.0196. And that gives us 4.312 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of MnO4-. And then we have the equation that we worked out earlier, where we found that one mole of MnO4- minus reacted with five moles of Fe2+. Plus. So that ratio of one to five is really important because all we need to do now is declare that in 25 cm cubed of Fe2+, plus, there will be five times the number of moles. So that works out at 2.156 times 10 to the minus three. Then for the third mark, we need to track back and say, right, well, we were using 25 cm cubed. So in the 250 cm cubed, there will, of course, be 10 times the number of moles. So that's 2.156 times 10 to the minus 2. And then because we want the percentage by mass, we need to convert that moles into mass by multiplying it by the relative atomic mass of iron, 55.8. And when we do that, we get a mass of 1.203 grams. So what that means is we thought we had 1.27 grams of iron, but actually we've only got 1.203 grams of pure iron. And so the final thing that we need to do is work out the percentage mass of carbon. And it's really important to notice, I didn't underline it earlier, but it's carbon that is our final goal, not iron. So if we found this 1.203 grams of pure iron, then the difference between the impure mass and this pure iron is the mass of carbon that we have, which is 0.067 grams. And so the percentage by mass of carbon now is that number divided by the total mass, 1.270, and then multiplied by 100, which gets us 5.28% to two decimal places. And then the final two parts of this question are sort of working scientifically questions. And they're asking us in the first one how we can ensure the reliability of the results obtained in the experiment. And so that means how confident can you be that you actually got the correct answer. And so to do that, you would repeat the titration and take an average of the concordant results because they don't mention doing more than one titration. And we don't know that 19.6 was correct. And then in the follow-up, suggest one way in which the reliability of the analysis could be improved. So the difference between D and E is one of them is talking about the result of the titration, and one of them is talking about the reliability of the whole process. Because remember, they're analysing the purity of iron coming out of the blast furnace. So that means the whole process of quality control in the blast furnace. 
And there, what we would say is, well, we would want to analyze samples from more than one different part of the blast furnace. So you wouldn't just take one sample of molten iron, you'd take several samples of molten iron, probably from different parts of the blast furnace. And once you'd analyzed those samples, you could be confident that the results that you're reporting are going to be correct and true and reliable. This second question is a similar kind of question. We are still doing a percentage purity analysis, but it's eight marks because there's quite a lot more going on in terms of the chemical reactions themselves. So this time we are analyzing a white solid that is a mixture of three different things. Sodium ethane dioate, ethane dioic acid dihydrate, and an inert solid and 1.90 grams of this solid was made up to a volume of 250 centimeters cubed of aqueous solution. And then two different titrations were carried out with this solution. In the first one, a 25 cm cubed sample was taken out, added to an excess of sulfuric acid, and this was then placed in a conical flask. That conical flask was warmed up to 60 degrees C, and titrated with potassium manganate 7. When the titration was carried out, 26.5 cm cubed of potassium manganate 7 was added before the solution changed colour. The equation for the reaction is shown below. We'll return to that when we start doing the calculation. And then a second titration was carried out with a second sample of the solution, another 25 cm cubed portion. This time it was titrated with sodium hydroxide and we know the concentration of sodium hydroxide there. It was using phenolphthalein indicator because sodium hydroxide is a strong base. And the indicator changed colour after the addition of 10.45 cm cubed of sodium hydroxide solution. The equation for this reaction is shown below and the ratio will be important in a moment. Now, the important thing to clarify before we dive into the calculations is what actually is reacting in each of these two separate titrations. So first up, the chemical that is inert never reacts, so that doesn't get involved. The second titration is more clear cut because we're reacting with sodium hydroxide, which is a base. So this is actually an acid base titration and so the only chemical that will react in the acid base titration is the ethane dioic acid dihydrate, which in my pie chart that I've drawn to represent the three chemicals is this one that I've drawn in red here. There is no significance about the size of my proportions. I've just shown that there are three separate chemicals involved. So in this second titration, we are going to be working out the moles of the ethane dioic acid dihydrate that reacts with the sodium hydroxide. The inert um, solid never reacts. In the first titration, it is a redox titration because the potassium manganate seven is going to change its oxidation state from plus seven to plus two. And so the ethane dioate ion is what is going to react with that manganate seven. And the complicated part here is that there is ethane dioate ions present in the both of the two compounds, so the ethane dioic acid dihydrate and in the sodium ethane dioate. So when we do the redox titration in the first equation and work out the moles of ethane dioate ions, that is the moles of both of these two ions added together. And so what we're going to have to do to finish this off is take the moles of ethane dioic acid dihydrate and subtract it away from the total moles of ethane dioate ion. Let's dive in on the calculations. So suppose you are in a bit of confusion. You have been given two concentrations and two volumes so we can work out the moles. So if we tackle the second titration first, doesn't really matter, but I think it's slightly easier to do that. The first thing that we can do is we can work out the moles of sodium hydroxide added in the titration. And so that is conch times vol, so that gets us 1.045 times 10 to the minus 3 moles of sodium hydroxide. Then when we see the equation, it is a 2 to 1 ratio. So that means the moles of ethane dioic acid present is going to be half that number. 
Remember, this is moles in 25 cm cubed. That will become significant in a moment. Then if we take the first titration, we can work out the moles of potassium manganate 7 by again doing concentration 0.02 multiplied by volume 0.0265. And that then gives us a moles of 5.3 times 10 to the minus 4. And then if we take a look at the equation, this is a 2 to 5 ratio. So what we need to do is divide that number by 2 and multiply it by 5. And that gives us a moles of ethane dioate ion of 1.325 times 10 to the minus 3. Now remember, this is ethane dioate from the acid and the salt. And so what we have to do now is we have to take away the proportion that is from the acid from that total. So what we've calculated as M4 is all of the ethane dioate and we need to subtract away the ethane dioate from the acid, which was M2. So the fifth mark is for taking M2 away from M4. And when we do that, we get the difference of 8.025 times 10 to the minus 4. Now, as I say, this is in one of our titrations, 25 cm cubed. So we need to scale it back up to work out how many moles of ethane dioate, sodium ethane dioate, there were in the original 250 cm cubed sample. So that's just multiplying it by 10, which is 8.025 times 10 to the minus 3. Now, our final marks are to convert that moles of sodium ethane dioate into a mass by multiplying by the MR. The MR of sodium ethane dioate is 134, and so the mass of sodium ethane dioate is 1.075 grams. And so the percentage of ethane dioate in the original sample is that value, 1.075, divided by the total mass, which is 1.90, multiplied by 100, which gets us a percentage of 56.6 to three significant figures. Okay, that's the end of this question. That's the end of the video. I'll be back soon with another question walkthrough. I'll see you then.